Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and good morning still to the West Coast. Tim, uh, glad to have you with us from California as well. I'm Craig McAtee, the Executive Director and CEO of the National Coalition of Advanced Technology Centers. And uh, we're glad to have uh, all of our panel with us today and all of those that have signed up to be registered. We are recording this session and it will be posted on our website shortly thereafter today. Just so look for it by Monday at the latest. Um, I'm going to drop in the chat um, the newsletter link because that's how uh, closely tied it is to the articles that these uh, uh, great board members of NCTC um, have written, and they'll discuss that briefly. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our the president of our NCTC board of directors, Amanda Sizemore. She's vice president of workforce development at St. Charles Community College in Missouri, and she's going to introduce the, briefly the rest of the panel and I'll talk to you at the end of the session. Please engage as you can. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us for this afternoon's uh, discussion for the most part and engaging with us. I wanna introduce our speakers for the afternoon. Tim Baber, he is the chair for welding and manufacturing technology at the College of the Canyons in California. Terry Burgess Sandu. She is the Director of Talent and Business Innovation with the Rain County Community College in Ohio. And Alicia Udy, Polytechnic Outreach Director for Bismarck State College in North Carolina. Our facilitator for this afternoon is uh, John Beck. He is the Director and PI for the National Center for Autonomous Technologies at Northland Community and Technical College in Minnesota. John. Well, thank you very much for the uh, introductions. It's great to uh, be here today, coming off the first in-person NCATC Fall Conference in three years that was hosted at Rowan Cabarrus in uh, North Carolina, September 21st to the 23rd. That was a great event, great opportunity to be back on site with everyone and really talking about the type of discussions that we're going to launch into today. Uh, today's webinar is a part of a multi-part series, uh, quarterly webinar member drop-ins that are really focused on the four strategic areas of NCATC's work, the Future Workforce Industry 4.0, Apprenticeships Work-Based Learning, Competency-Based Learning, and Industry-Recognized Credentials, and adult education. Uh, today's session is gonna be specifically focusing on industry 4.0. We've got our three panelists who will all share a little bit about their work at their host institution, um, some of the neat and innovative things that are going on, the successes of those programs, as well as some of the challenges. And then we'll invite everyone else to participate. We want this to really be a free flowing discussion um, as NCATC represents more than 170 colleges throughout the nation, more than 40 strategic partners, and a big part of the work is really the networking, collaboration, um, understanding the resources that are available out there, and what resources we really need to be looking for and identifying as kind of the critical things that will help the group move. Um, so with that, we'll start off with our uh, panelist discussions. We've got... Tim Baber, who's going to be first to uh, present, Director of Talent and Business Innovation. Uh, correction. Uh, Tim, you are at uh, the Chair for Welding and Manufacturing Technology at the College of the Canyons. So I think I'll start with turning it over to you to hear about some of the neat work that you've got going on. Thank you, John. And I just want to echo what a pleasure it was to be back in person at the uh, Fall NCATC conference some great industry tours, a lot of collaboration, a lot of great networking opportunities. So uh, I would encourage you to stay involved, attend the conferences because you just don't know what you're gonna learn, uh, the people that you're gonna meet, the connections. I mean, that really at the end of the day, that's what NCTC is all about is helping others, networking, creating, uh, creating opportunities. A little bit about College of the Canyons, we're located about 30 miles north of LA. Um, if you've been out our way, we're just a kitty corner from Magic Mountain. Um, so we have a great relationship with, with them in regards to, you know, the training needs and whatnot. Um, we have two separate campuses. Uh, our, the mothership, as I call it, is in the Valencia area, and then we also have a sister college in Candy Country. Um, our path in Industry 4.0 has been a lengthy one at best. 
um, having a manufacturing and, and for credit instructional program and then having uh, another wing of that called, we call the CAC, the Center for Applied Center for Technologies through our Econ Dev program, training incumbent workers. And it was kind of a, a battle to really get our four credit program substantiated to where it stood alone. So there was a lot of, I guess, missed signals within our local industry. And our industry sector has a significant amount of aerospace in our area. So we have a lot of the big primes and, and their needs. Um, I mean, we hear their pain points. It's all about, they can't find people. And you know, for, for us looking at where we needed to be in regards to industry 4.0, 4, 4 um, who better to connect with was with, was with NCATC. Um, and really attending the first couple of conferences and really learning about N NCATC and before becoming a, a board member and really having that in the back of my mind because we really came to a, to a dividing moment at our college to where, how are we gonna get the buy-in on our institution? from admin all the way down to, you know, down to faculty. How are we gonna let industry know that this is what we envision? And of course we want them at the plate. And so there's a lot of, lot of challenges in regards to getting a one vision uh, moving forward. And, and in 2019, we had Craig and, and Tom, uh, uh, partner in crime, come out to College of the Canyons and do a membership assistance program uh, analysis, which really, you know, did that create a huge significant, you know, change? Well, we still had to get the buy-in. We have the document that says what we should be doing, and it sure also speaks to what we're not doing well, but more importantly, what should we be doing in the next five to 10 years based on all the industry data, labor market data, industry input from all the stakeholders, and really trying to get that report as our guiding document. And it's been a struggle, but with that document, always going back to the document, we have continued that, that dialogue and with our campus, our administrators, and now we have the buy-in that we need. And we're currently uh, outfitting a temporary ATC because I call it the mothership, which was, was uh, basically the suggestion was a 100,000 square foot building. We're starting out with roughly about a $15,000 or 15,000 square foot building as our first step, which will really comprise of, of machine tool, uh, robotics, uh, precision measurement, uh, metrology, is really kind of to align with what our local industry needs as a, as a first step. Uh, in the mothership, the 100,000 square foot building will have welding, uh, additive, subtractive manufacturing, construction, mechatronics, and whatever else comes to bear at that time. But once again, getting this program up and going, that the MAP report has been essential for us to move forward because we've really just had too many chefs in the kitchen to try and come up with a common goal. And I think one of the things that I've realized in going, being on the uh, on the board of NCATC and touring other uh, sites, I always I always tell you know the folks that come with me is don't you have regrets when you when you tour these other sites and you realize God I wish we had this back on our campus. I mean it, it uh, Craig Lamb's uh, you know institution on the, one of the industry tours. I'm like this is just awesome. But this is where you're going to learn what to bring back to your campus. And here's where it's you know they've already done this. Why reinvent the wheel? It's just, you know, getting it on your campus and getting it done, you know, whether or not you're doing a campaign uh, to try and come up with the funds and, you know, the month, the, the, the funds that are necessary, how braided funds comes into place, uh, comes into place sometimes, um, but really trying to put it all into a one path and put a bow on the end of it. I, I can't tell you how important that map report has been. So we're real uh, excited to bring, uh, you know, all the pieces and parts of that together. Uh, we're currently, you know, working on developing a, a built a business, business industry leadership team with our local industry to help obviously bring uh, other programs on board at the at our temporary ATC. Um, we've also had uh, great interest with FANUC Robotics to become actually a, a certification center. So we're real excited about bringing uh, FANUC on board. Um, and as we build out the, the mothership, uh, uh, as I keep saying, uh, we we plan on bringing in other uh, you know manufacturers as well of, of you know machining equipment. So we kind of have a blended approach. Um, yeah. So once again, uh, I can't emphasize how important it is to network and get in touch with others within this NCATC to learn from their challenges and their successes to bring that home to your own campus. And with that, I'll turn it back over to John. Awesome. That uh, that sounds great and and really good developments there is yeah take a look at the resources available again through NCATC with the, the MAP membership assistance program to help chart direction and 
how that really impacts the uh, the different steps along the way of that process. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, I think I'll actually do a uh, mid meeting uh, break here to make sure to do some introductions for the other members too. Typically we do a roll call right at the front here. Um, and I wanna make sure to connect or understand who else is on the line. So maybe if we could go through and do some quick introductions uh, for those outside the panel too, that would be helpful. Um, I'll start just kind of going in order as I see it on my screen here with Faith Alexander. Do you want to give just a quick introduction to your organization and any specific interesting uh, points you're looking to get from today? Well, I hope you can hear me. Can you yep. hear me? You are coming okay. through clear. I'm Faith Alexander in uh, Texas City, Texas, about 25 miles south of Houston. And we have a grant from the National Science Foundation, Robotic Process Automation. So I'm real interested in the future of work. Awesome. Well, we're glad you're here today. Uh, Chaitra, did I pronounce that right? And I'll keep going here while you're maybe getting the audio up. Kara, Kara Brown. Hi, yes, I'm with Lincoln Economic Development in Lincoln County, North Carolina. Um, a little new to the organization and I'm tuning in to learn more. Awesome, that sounds good. Glad to have you here today. Uh, Scott. Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Scott Murakami. I am the Director, uh, I am the coordinator for economic development for the State Department of um, Business, Economic Development, and Tourism in, in Hawaii. Uh, I used to be a board member on NCATC many years ago and uh, still serve on your committee for government relations. So thank you all for joining and uh, look forward to uh, learning more about what you're doing. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Jennifer? I'm Jen Maynard. I'm a strategic initiatives coordinator for regional development for Sinclair Community College. We are, we just revitalized our industrial maintenance technology lab and just curious as to what is on the radar. I'm currently working on a sixth grade STEM fair. So I want to see, you know, if you have any nuggets that I can incorporate, fold in, or, you know, something new and exciting that I can wow the sixth graders of Warren County with. That sounds great. Thank you for being here today. And Chitra? Hi, um, I'm Chitra Jaurekar, uh, Dean of STEM at Mass Bay Community College. We are um, uh, about uh, on, on Route 9, very close to Boston, um, located in a um, in a semi-urban environment where we also draw students from Boston and um, uh, greater Boston region, as well as the Metro West um, of Boston area. Um, we have manufacturing programs. We work closely with, um, uh, we are actually developing a, um, a multi-university uh, collaboration with MIT um, and some of the regional colleges as well as uh, uh, universities and community colleges in New York. So uh, exciting work happening and I'm here to learn about um, all the work that is going on as, as well as um, and uh, as well as to um, to uh, to hear about the future of work. Um, so very excited. Thank you. Yes, thank you for being here. And thank you all for the uh, the introductions. Um, I think we'll we'll transition over to Sari, uh, or Terry Sandu, Director, Talent and Business Innovation at uh, Lorraine County Community College to provide an overview of your work. Yeah, hi, thanks. And hi, everybody. It's nice to meet you. Um, we uh, In the newsletter this last time, we provided an update of our 
um, our second applied baccalaureate program, which is in automation and robotics. It has a long name, smart industrial automated something technician. <laughs> um, but basically it's a, it extends our two-year program. We now are able to uh, directly, uh, we got approval um, at all levels. So we have formally launched that program, um, but it really ties in very much with our overall industry 4.0 strategy. Um, we've, you know, the institution has, has a long history. We've got a really robust microelectronics program. We are doing new work in um, uh, cybersecurity and trusted and assured microelectronics, uh, which is, is important to national defense and other uh, related fields. Um, this, this work, the, the things I just wanted to highlight about this work, um, a, there's a lot of information we can share with you. So if you are, if you are, if you have faculty doing work in automation robotics, please feel free to reach out. Um, I will connect you to Lori Bacchus on our team. We've got just a ton of, of work that has happened. Um, we, it, so our degree had really strong industry support and continues to be deeply engaged with, uh, we have partners like FANUC and Rockwell, uh, IST that are deeply in Lincoln Electric that have been deeply involved in designing it and really helping to look at the credentials that it aligns to the industry recognized credentials. Um, we we heavily leveraged. Um, I know Craig's been involved with this and prob probably others, but you know we heavily leveraged the work of ARM, the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute. Um, we actually had had a we had won a workforce investment grant from ARM to expand an earn and learn model that we had in automation robotics um, or that we had into automation and robotics. And luckily I had that grant because then we were um, the, we partner closely with the Ohio Manufacturers Association and they had been approached by our Lieutenant Governor who leads our state's workforce strategies to help narrow down um, a priority list of credentials in that space that the state should invest in. So, because we, you know, and so um, OMA used its relationships to convene um, pretty, you know, all the, all the big companies that you would think would be in a room, um, like an electric, many of the ones I just mentioned, as well as uh, Festo and some others. And um, to, and they looked at a list of like 3,500 credentials and narrowed it down to about slightly over 300. So still a big list, but a lot smaller than the 3,500. So again, all of that was written up, so happy to share that. So we um, were able to help co-facilitate that group. <clears throat> and that's what this uh, Lori Bacchus, who's on my team did. And um, so it really gave us that opportunity to build the relationships that as you all know we need to inform the degree. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the other things we talk about, and I'm gonna need to get a drink of water because of course the body's gonna do what it's gonna do. As you all know, one of the <coughs> challenges we all face is the shortage of teachers. So we've also created with those industry partners, a teacher education program that is really designed for someone that does not have to have a STEM background. So um, <coughs> it um, prepares them to earn some certifications that they can then themselves teach. And it's also NACTI certified. So they're earning the, uh, it's the FCR 2 certification, which I believe is a, um, and then also NACTI, uh, a NACTI certification that's based on the FANUC handling tools, uh, operations and programming skills. So again, lots of information that we can share. I, I share that because, so we've got the bachelor's degree, which of course ties into our, uh, we have, we also launched a short-term robotics certificate. And by that, I mean, it's something that can be completed in one semester, and then that stacks to our one year, and then that stacks to our associate, and that stacks to our bachelors. And it, it's really designed to be very nimble so that we can also customize that for industry. And then with the teacher education, the idea is how do we get more high school teachers, more career tech teachers? Uh, interestingly, we've had a number of university faculty reach out that are going through the training. So um, it's really designed to be kind of a hand in glove strategy to how do we increase capacity, not just at our college, but across the statewide system. So um, I share that because we're looking at that as a model. I'm really glad to see Sinclair on here. Um, you know, we uh, have had one of the sources of funding for some of this work has been the Department of Defense. Um, Sinclair is leading uh, strategies around digital thread to replicate that, that approach, that model. 
um, in the state. So we do have a lot going on in Industry 4.0. I am by no means the technical expert, but I can talk a lot about, I, I won't talk now unless you have questions about it, but how we braid funding, how we try to weave together different grants, different strategies to really help advance this overall goal. Um, certainly, as you may know, in Ohio, Intel is coming in. So, you know, we're really being challenged now to say, okay, how do we take some of these same strategies and methodologies and apply them to the semiconductor industry? So I'll stop there and, and say, I know that's a really quick high level overview, but hopefully enough to give you a taste of what we're doing. And I'm happy to answer questions uh, about all of that. And I'll just say to John's point, Jonathan's, uh, we leverage Craig's expertise in this network all the time. So we really, really value our, our membership in NCATC. Thank you. Well, I'll pause there. If anyone does have questions, please do feel free to uh, pop on and ask those or put those in the chat. I know from, from the comments that you'd made, Jennifer, with the uh, different strategies or best practices in recruitment and reaching different audiences, I think that's a unique dynamic that you talk about. Terry, with the programs there as far as the CTE teachers program and trying to bridge that gap as there's a recognized gap right now for teachers in CTE education, looking at innovative ways to, to uh, fill that and address those needs. Are, are there any other thoughts from the group as far as uh, what, what are some of your initiatives that are being done to attract students and additional teachers to CTE and Industry 4.0 programs and careers? Any good examples that uh, the, you, the panel or members are working on? Jonathan, this is not an answer to your question, but I think it was Jennifer Maynard at Sinclair who said you're working with junior high students. I'll just, if you, I know Sinclair is also implementing Flex Factor, and um, Flex Factor does have a middle school sprint that we've used. We have 500 middle school students coming in soon, so it's something to consider. If, uh, again, I don't know how you all where you fit in the org chart, um, but um, hopefully you're familiar with Flex Factor and just be aware that there may be some modules there, or, or you know, use that as part of your STEM programming. I'm not part of this, the Flex Factor um, group that's working with Sinclair. This is a pilot program that we're, it's sort of like a mini STEM fair for sixth graders. So it's not a classroom, it's an offsite half day immersion experience. Um, if the pilot's successful, we have someone in the county that's willing to pick it up for all sixth graders, but it's not, um, programming inserted into the classroom per se. Okay, and I see there's a question from Amanda in the chat uh, in regards to the CTE teachers training. Uh, CTE qualified teachers in non-traditional ways, is this approved by K-12 strategy or only post-secondary? Was that a question for me, Amanda? I believe so. Sure. Oh, <laughs> well, our, so our teacher training program is as open to people who are already educators. So, um, but we're at, we're preparing them to teach to these specific credentials that the automation robotics industry partners have identified are valuable. So I, I don't know if that's answering your question, the, the issue of how we qualify people that I know is much bigger and probably better addressed from someone from the academic side. It's, it's a, definitely a challenge but it but you're focusing on post-secondary or is this a, a we, secondary strategy you know what Anna, so we originally designed it thinking it would be for high school students or high school teachers um that is our it is remains one of our primary audiences but we've actually had engagement from educators at career tech centers community colleges and universities um actually ohio state university is sending they want to send a whole cohort. They, they have their own class that they've asked us to do. Um, now I'm, we're trying to be very strategic with the high school students. I'd, I mean, the high school teachers, I'd really like to get, because it's just hard to get them to commit. You can imagine they're super busy and it, there is an externship that's involved in the summer. 
So um, we're trying to look at where the state has identified, really prioritized some school districts, especially those districts that are serving our, you know, underrepresented or high poverty districts that have even more challenges to participating and really trying to partner with industry so that they will encourage, you know, maybe, maybe it's a local industry person who has that first conversation with the superintendent who then has the conversation with the principal who then identifies the teacher. So we're not there yet, but it is designed for uh, all levels of the, of the educational system. And I see we've got a hand up from Scott. Uh, I have a question about um, incumbent worker training. Is anyone doing, you know, I think it's important to get people into the jobs and into the pathway, but what about after that? Are you folks working with industry on maintaining um, the, or, or helping incumbent workers expand their skill sets? Because that's part of the challenge with the digital divide and with industry um, 4.0, right? IoT accelerates so, everything so quickly that how are we ensuring that the people who are working are maintaining their skill set? Thanks. I can share that we through our employee, through our econ dev group, we have a program called Employee Technical Institute, which does that fast track short term uh, boot camps for local industry. And it's really designed with the industry's needs and wants, uh, you know, obviously taken in consideration. So we've got a pretty good platform of, you know, precision measurement, SolidWorks, CATIA, um, you know, our basic machining, CNC machining, things of that nature. And so those are, those are offered throughout the year. We also do what we call it, it's a CNC cohort, which is short term where they do, it's 10 weeks and they do, they learn, they go through uh, tooling you, they get all the, you know, the safety and all that done first, and then they transition over to the manual machining. And then we take them over and they actually do the CNC. We've got a really good placement rate for those candidates that go through the program. And we're also doing the, uh, the UAA, the Uniquely Abled Autistic Program uh, with a, the cohorts just a little bit longer, uh, I think another two weeks. Uh, we've had great uh, success with that with placement with local industry. I can put you in touch with uh, John Milburn from our college if that would help uh, and you could learn from what they're doing because that is a separate, whole separate function from instruction, which I don't deal with day to day, but I can definitely put you in touch with John if that would help. And that sounds like it's um, sort of like a short-term boot camp programs that are targeted to um, unique populations to help them with employment. Um, do you folks have programs that like are that build off of what you're doing to the credit programs that you know support people once they're at work. So let's say they go through your programs, they're, you know, they graduate, get placed into a job. And then do companies send them back for additional types of training to make sure their skill set stays current? And, and I'm curious if those those types of classes extend beyond the technical aspect, right? Do they get into management? Do they get into team development? you know, finance, other areas to build a stronger work base um, that are technical yet provide for the ability for adaptive changes in the future. And that's to the whole group, not just to you, thanks. Yeah, I'll address that a little bit and then others please jump in is, you know, I would I would say yes. I mean, definitely, you know, we have our, all, all, a really robust non-credit and, and leadership training program and, um, you know, and again, using just the example of our automation robotics lab, it's been designed specifically to be a space that's both for our students and for industry. You know, we know that one of the challenges is that, especially for small, medium-sized companies, they they themselves are trying to figure out how to play with this new technology. So we've designed our expanded advanced technology center to be a space where companies can come in and do some of that, uh, figure out some of that. Um, and then like this teacher education program I mentioned is actually designed to also be used for exactly what you're talking about, Scott, which is upskilling um, incumbent workers. We've, we've had three companies already express really strong interest. Um, it, what we're finding, and this probably will sound familiar, is they're ready to go and then they stop. So uh, we had one company that wanted to send 90 people through it and then they had, you know, they're they're going through some mergers. So, but we know that, so we've gotten really good feedback that it is the training they need. It's, it's getting them, you know, it's, it, it can be hard to get companies to make that commitment, but I want to hear from others about what they're doing to Scott's question. 
Hi, Alicia from Bismarck State. Um, I would say we do a lot of this. And one thing with advancements in technology um, that are happening so fast, I think one thing that excites me at our institution is the blending of non-credit and credit together. And so we use, you know, prior to our polytechnic mission change, I feel like our campus works individually um, more often than we do now. So looking at how we can embrace this together and advancements and upskilling that industry needs, do we already need to be bringing that into our programming um, that we're teaching at the certificate or associate level and being able and to be able to leverage those programs and those offerings together to make them sustainable um, is, is another way that we're approaching approaching this. And so just like a Terry mentioned, lab space and, and bringing in equipment, you know, for credit versus non-credit, that's gone away. It's who needs it and what delivery method do they need it, whether it's a credit bearing student or industry looking to upscale themselves. Um, and I think we're seeing great success in, in being able to bring those together. I think the hard part, and maybe other institutions feel this way too, is getting industry to understand that. Like we have credit offering courses, you could take a single course and in some of those, even those leadership or you know, career skill courses that you, know, you want somebody to take a finance class that was a you know, mechatronics graduate and you want them to understand more about finance that even on the credit side, somebody can take that course for professional development. I'll say that's one thing that do our built models that we're trying to really help industry or learn that terminology and understanding that the credit bearing programs and courses within it you know, can be taken from a professional in the industry already to get that skill set. Like you don't have to be a fully, at our institution, you do not have to roll full time. You do not have to particularly enroll in programs to take some of that coursework. And how do we make those options available more to professionals already working in the workforce? That would be a challenge I think we're facing in this area. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people in that boat that really see the potential in that to uh, be able to flex in the advanced technology labs that they offer for industry professionals. I know we're seeing that across the aerospace and automotive industry where there is definitely a need for those who are already in the workforce working to get advanced training in some of the different technology areas across aerospace and automotive. But definitely a lot of challenges like you talk about for getting that the right structure and framework in place. I know we've been making strides in the competency-based education uh, models to modularize content that opens up flexible lab opportunities to meet some of those needs, but continuing to uh, to look at that balance and in, in credit to non-credit and how to really meet those industry needs for professionals in the workforce who are looking at the upskilling needs today. I'm curious, have you folks from the industry side um, seen an increase in demand for that level of training? Where, you know, more incumbent worker training um, that's modularized, meant specifically for a particular type of, uh, um, I don't know, competency? Yes, I guess we are in our region. I think there's other head nodding. Um, I think definitely that is, and maybe it's just because of the, such the fast advancement and be able to focus on that short skill set and how do we how do we deliver and what does that look like? Um, yes, I mean at our institution for the first time we have more adult students than traditional students, and we have more part time students than full time students in a fall semester. And I think that's just the trending of people potentially going to the workforce sooner, just because of the job opportunities that they have and they pay, at least that's in the, our region, that's what we're facing. It's challenging to compete against some of these employers. And so now, but now what we're seeing is now they're investing in those individuals to come back and become trained and become certified. And, you know, thankfully we're being considered as, as one of those training entities that they can, they can utilize to meet those needs. I'm sorry, Alicia, what maybe what country are you in? Where, where I'm in from? North Dakota. It's like its own country, right? Just like Hawaii. Yeah. Hawaii, we're our own country. <laughs> and maybe this is a good transition point back to the last presentation that we had scheduled for the panel um, and having you give an overview, Alicia, of the programs at Bismarck yeah. State College. I know you've launched the, uh, the programs related to cyber, which you've been touching on a little bit here, but would you yeah. maybe want to provide sure. an overview and dig back into the conversation? Sure. So, um, so at BSC, we in this particular article, we focus on some of the cybersecurity work we're doing. And so 
as been mentioned, um, we had a cybersecurity program, a two and four year uh, program. And so as we're transitioning to a polytechnic institution, um, our leadership has really taken, challenged us with how do we develop short-term certificates um, that not only upskill people quicker and sooner to get into the workforce because workforce is a challenge. We have a very, very low unemployment rate in the state of North Dakota. Um, but how do we also attract that adult student that's potentially looking to upskill themselves um, with, within a modernization of digital technology? And so within our cybersecurity program, we um, you know, had the two and four year traditional model. We're still going to have that um, and continue to offer that. But we basically took our programming and worked with our um, cyber built team to develop six short term credentials, um, short term certificates that were focused on particular skill sets. Um, and thinking in mind, not only to train your traditional students, potentially get a short-term certificate and go to the workforce and work and have a credential maybe a little bit quicker, but also as we've been discussing that adult learner or professionals already in the industry looking to upskill themselves. So when we developed these, it was on key skills and abilities that that built team you know, gave guidance to us on and also looking at those industry credentials. And as Terry was talking about, um, all those standards and credentials you can earn in manufacturing, cybersecurity is exactly the same way. So it is hard because there's so many options, but what were some of the high priority certifications, industry recognized credentials that they wanted to see us focus on? And, and so that was the work we did. So when we took those certificates, so we use 16 credits. I think as educators, you know, we all know what the financial aid ability of 16 credits, but also the ability potentially to finish in, in one semester. And then as we're sitting around the table and looking at these, we realize that we have a cybersecurity fundamental certificate that could be very well done in high schools. And so we engaged with our, our high school system, our career and tech ed within the state and said, we have a short-term certificate in cybersecurity fundamentals that we want to work with you to integrate into the high school system. And so as sophomores in high school in the state of North Dakota, students can start taking this coursework. They could potentially graduate with the certificate at the same time they're graduating from high school. And so being able to integrate that in, they're getting high school credit, they're getting college credit. And so maybe they exit high school into the workplace um, and maybe they continue their education. But either way, it was just another opportunity to create awareness um, and show them sometimes really that ability that they have the ability to earn that credential and continue their education into college. So it's attracted a, a wide variety um, of students into, um, into that particular short-term certificate. The other project we talked about in our article was um, we were one of, I think it was like 14 colleges awarded us Sky cyber skills grants from AACC and Microsoft. Um, and so that's been a fun project as we were uh, talking earlier, it's really just to be able to collaborate and share best practices of how we're trying to stay abreast and on top of cybersecurity um, skills and, and what's coming next. And the, so collaboration team to share best practices, cha share challenges. And I'll say a lot of work on that has been about how do we recruit trained faculty members. So same challenges that you're discussing are the same challenges we're discussing and just sharing ideas as we're all trying to work together to do this. So that, you know, that project is just like NCATC, which they're part of it is just really that networking opportunity. We've met a lot of great individuals to not only enhance and robust our programs, but hopefully we can share some of the best practices um, that we're doing too. And then the last project is maybe an exciting project because it's over. No, that's not why it's exciting, but we hosted 80 middle school students on our campus for five days. We put them through 36 hours of cybersecurity training. And so um, my advice to Jen is the more hands-on you can make it, the more engaged they are. These middle schoolers are, um, they're very engaged in like learning and being challenged. They don't necessarily have as many barriers or preconceptions. And so I think they're, you can, you can get them excited pretty quickly, but we hosted a camp um, thanks to the National Security Administration and NSF and it was free. And so being that it was free, we really try to focus on some minorities in our region. Um, and so we worked with a, a local uh, Native American reservation and brought in 16 students from there and housed them and, and had them on our campus for a week. Um, and then in addition to within our region, just focusing on, on some of those underrepresented populations to give them the, the opportunity to participate in the camp. So we had them running our robotic quadrupeds or robotic dogs and they did a, um, 
a fun activity that we had. Well, they learned how to hack after they signed an ethical responsibility um, form because they really did learn how to hack. And so then they're sitting there saying, I'm going to hack my sister's computer. It's like, no, you signed that form. But so gave them some of those hacking things. But um, we did a digital escape room. They just enjoyed that. And that was that was a lot of fun that we could share some of that out if people are looking to do camps. But um, it was very successful and we get a host again in uh, this coming summer, another 80 to 100 middle schoolers. Um, again, I think our challenge will be what's going to be new because many of them want to come back um, to the camp. So that that's obviously a good thing. And so then as we look ahead, we are, um, thanks to a map study that we did with NCATC, we are building a polytechnic training center. Um, and so I'm not getting the details on that necessarily, but in regards to cybersecurity, we're building a security operations center to not only train our students to see what it's like to work in a, a SOC, um, but also for business and industry. So working actually with our state um, on that initiative, we're creating a digital hive space. So instead of a traditional maker space, it's for the digital, those people focus on digital technologies. And um, I say, we call it kind of the geek space for the digital, the digital people. And that's for our students and the community. So I'll be open to the community and also engaging in K to 12 with that. And then our last little initiative that we're looking at doing is actually doing a digital bus. So we're gonna put that on wheels. Um, we're very rural, obviously in North Dakota. And so how can we take some of those um, robotics and automation and cybersecurity and, um, and uh, introduce it to our rural communities within our state? So that's that's kind of a goal. We haven't, um, we have some ideas of what a bus could look like and I gotta get my CDL license. So I'll support our CE department. So I learned how to drive a bus, but um, no, we're kind of excited about something in regards to that to support the ruralness of, of North Dakota. So I need to stay connected with you because I've had this vision of the fun bus for like a yeah. year and a half and everybody just keeps looking at me like I have three heads and I'm like, I worked at the electric company. We had a line demonstration that was in a huh? trailer. We can right? do it. <laughs> I'll send, I have some stuff. So I have like a mock-up of what my bus would look like kind of and just the vision and mission around what we're doing. So I can, I can, I'll get your email. I can definitely send it to you. We can connect so that's great because i think you have to take it to them because these these schools are challenged they don't have the finances that's part of my grant is paying for the bus and the bus driver to bring these kids for the pilot okay you know so it's how we have to find a way to get to them before our kids in ohio get to the eighth grade and they have to pick the what do i want to be when i grow up and it's doctor lawyer teacher nurse right <laughs> right yes, yes. Jennifer, before I forget, if you want to email me and I can put my email in the chat, we did, one of my staff did just create some STEM activities for third, four, I think third through seventh graders. So happy to connect to you if that would be helpful. She's amazing. That would be awesome. And I'll put my email in the chat too. Terry, this is Alicia. Do you want to send me that too, please? Yeah. <laughs> just send it out. Just send it out. Okay. <laughs> we all want it. Well, that sounds good and definitely feel free to put your contact information and email address in the chat to get follow-up emails from today's conversation those those key points of interest i think that's a lot of great examples of looking at ways to go about outreaching engaging new audiences and i think there's a, a definite connection there as you talk about the structure that you've set up with those micro modules for high school students to get them engaged early and often both in the informal learning that creates that connection to the program interest and then those ways that they can start working towards credentials in high school. So a lot of great examples there of uh, some different recruitment strategies. And with that, I think at this, this point, we'd like to kind of transition and open up the floor. If those uh, not on the panel wanted to also um, share a little bit about your organization, what you're seeing for successes that would be great for the group here to be hearing about and thinking about models that are working as well as challenges and identifying what resources are currently lacking that are preventing you from being able to move forward on what you see as key uh, strategic initiatives for your organization advancement of program so if i've got anyone willing to uh, pop on the mic and talk about your programs a little bit and what you might want to see as far as support from NCATC, that'd be great. John, I, I was going to kind of follow up with Scott's question from earlier. It, with our employers, um, and I don't think I'm alone, um, they're just, 
you know, trying to keep the wheels on the bus since we're going with the bus theme. Um, <laughs> and it, while they're integrating a lot of technology in their in their facilities, in some cases, and not always, um, getting them off of the, we'll call it the floor or out of production has been a challenge. So we've ebbed and flowed with, we'll call it specific engagement or customized training or embedded training for incumbent worker. It, it has been a challenge. Um, they continue to um, want it, um, are exasperated because people don't have the skills they need, but to try to um, disengage them from the production floor has been a challenge. So in some cases, and it's not recent, so I'm not going to say post-COVID, we've literally gone to the floor, taken trainers to the floor, um, and, and built structured, uh, we'll call it job aids, standard operating procedures, and trained to the floor uh, just to get around it. It is not ideal. But in some cases, just to enable some progression of either skills or even career pathways, that's where we've had to go. Um, so it's not pretty, but that is a way we've done it in the past. And I see it happening um, again fairly quickly once they kind of um, get there, if you will. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Amanda. I would imagine that that's going to continue more, right? I mean, with the shortage of labor, because, you know, labor is really one of the big issues that's impacting and, economic growth. And, and I've been, uh, to be real honest, it's across industry channels. So one of the really interesting ones, and Alicia and I have talked about this, is healthcare. Mm -hmm. Healthcare is kind of going there. I mean, you'd be uh, with their, um, at least we'll call it a willingness to, talk about uh apprenticeship now mm -hmm. um it's it's they're they're going there we've got employer partners that are basically saying day one i'll take you and i'll pay for your training to be a patient care technician and i'll pay for you to keep going and i am i am hiring you to do that and oh by the way um, you you can be a LPN, you can be, and it's across their, they're encouraging all levels of their current staff as well as new staff, so. Yeah, and I think that's great to be able to get that type of industry investment in their future workforce, being able to support students as they're going through. And I think it opens up some unique opportunities from a mentorship standpoint of helping to uh, chart the individual's track, as well as companies being able to see cultural fits early on with the different employees that they're working with and mentoring. Um, so I think those are, those are great models to be able to have in place if you can create that value proposition for the industry partners to see what that investment really leads to. Other thoughts or conversation uh, from the group, things that you'd like to learn more about, or again, sharing out about your organization and successes and challenges? Well, hearing nothing, and I know we're coming up to the top of the hour, 10 minutes remaining. Uh, Craig, would you want to hop on real quick and talk about some of the uh, takeaway items that, that you heard from today that are in line with the NCATC mission and resources that the organization provides? Thanks, John. Uh, I'm real excited about what we heard today, even though it's a small uh, group here today, it's, it's quality. It's really a lot of interested folks sharing, and that's what this is all about, is uh, how do we beyond 130 people getting together face-to-face -to -face last week, which was great. How do we get other people to keep uh, collaborating beyond those events? So this is exactly what the member drop-in is all about. I'm putting in the chat um, a link to our Industry 4.0 page. 
And on that, you'll see some work we did in 2018 and 19 with AACC, the American Association of Community Colleges, funded by the Arconic Foundation, which is a, a high-tech division of, of uh, Alcoa, the aluminum uh, people, aluminum company. And uh, what we did there was with colleges like Lorraine and, and, and eight others, we did a study a whole year long about where they were internally at the college with their expertise in the nine or 10 columns, if you will, everything from industry 4.0, I'm sorry, any everything from the internet of things to cybersecurity with 3D printing, additive manufacturing, robotics, you name it, in their curriculum and their uh, expertise. We did the same thing with their employers at their communities. And they were joined at the hip through this year long study and coupled that with a lot of our strategic partners. Those studies are on this website for downloads. There's a toolkit that's called the executive toolkit that's aimed at both education and industry folks. At the top of the screen, there's a quick little 45 minute video that I happen to do for several organizations uh, over the last two years called Demystifying Industry 4.0. Really, if you think about it, it's not really that high tech if you break it down into bit, bit sized pieces where you think about your phones connected to the internet, your, your watch, your Alexa, and that's all the internet of things, but think about robots and conveyor systems and CNC machines and that big data analytics. It's really just getting your head wrapped around that and making it more accessible for everybody. And that's the demystifying part. Those are all on that website link that I just shared. Um, so I'm really excited about some of the contacts and, and, and collaboration that happened today on this uh, this session, John and, and everybody, thank you for your time. Uh, anything that you'd like to follow up? We're working with ACC this year on, as Alicia mentioned, the cybersecurity grant with uh, Microsoft. But we're also working on another Industry 4.0 grant with Caterpillar Foundation. And they're working on that with 42 different community colleges in their communities. And we'll be sharing those results as we have with the Arconic one over the next uh, few few months as well. So if you wanna know more about that, keep in touch with us. Um, and I'll I'll leave the last points uh, be, before I wanna ask anybody for final thoughts that they have before I close this out. Greg, I just thought I heard a lot of energy and interest around what members are doing to how we're translating some of these into content for youth. Um, you know, like Alicia Gorski, who I've mentioned has, we've, we've got a really cool fab cab that actually we can build for people that we take out to schools. Um, and I think I know Kelly and the team are creating content now, even for younger. So I think that'd be a cool follow-up uh, thing for NCATC to be thinking about how we capture some of these resources that people are willing to share. And uh, for those younger age could be good. Agreed, that's great. Yeah, let's keep that on a resource page that we're developing. Anybody else? I think another thing I've seen in line with that, thinking about recruitment and beyond the uh, typical high school education, career fairs, and middle school engagement is also thinking about community-based organizations that serve typically underrepresented communities in STEM education um, and careers and being able to connect early and often have continuous engagement activities that help create an awareness about the technology about the careers that exist and have that done with a educational institution to draw those lines to what an educational pathway looks like to make that a reality. I know that's something in the last couple of years here, we've really been thinking about how to connect with those organizations out there that have that in their mandate to be working with those communities that are typically underrepresented and drawing some of those great connecting lines and looking at how that can increase recruitment, enrollment, and, and really the future workforce that we desperately need. All right, well, I haven't heard anybody else chiming in, but uh, uh, we will send out a, a, a thank you for a follow up with everybody's contact information so you can keep connected. That's what this is all about, as I said up top. And uh, this is recorded, so it will be on our website by Monday this coming week, the 4th of October. So look for it and share it with your colleagues that didn't uh, weren't able to make it. Or if you want a quick recap, that's also a part of it. 
And then our next uh, fourth quarter uh, member drop-in is uh, December 15th, and it will focus on our second pillar, which is all about competency-based education coupled with industry-recognized credentials. And there will be articles in the newsletter on uh, the 10th or so of December that will be the preemptive uh, articles that we did uh, in advance. So please look for that and then uh, register if you'd like or share with your uh, colleagues and friends uh, that that will be coming up December 15th. And we'll have Amanda, Jonathan, and Scott Lucas from WSU Tech uh, part of that panel as well. So looking forward to seeing you all in the future. Please don't hesitate to contact us me directly if you need. Uh, we've got an Industry 4.0 self-assessment we can share with you that's pretty simple to get you started if you want. And uh, that's all I have, John. Thank you for all your time and expertise, everyone. That sounds great. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Tim, Terry, and Alicia for presenting on your, your programs and those opportunities to learn a little bit more about what's working well and, and the things we still need to find ways to address so thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. Appreciate the conversation. Look forward to future connections. Great rest of your day. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks.